Ooh, the lights went down too. Mood lighting just for me. This is nice. All right, people are still rolling in. We are going to, to jump right into our second, second half of today. Uh, how, how many people have, have experienced the joy of Ignite Talks before? We've got a few people. That's great. Ignites are super, super fun. So the, the idea is in the format. It's literally 20 slides that, that your presenters are going through in a five-minute period. So if you did a little math there, it's the five minutes divided by 20. They have about 15 seconds for each slide to actually communicate um, some just really, really meaningful point to you. So this is, these are a lot of fun. They move really fast. Um, before we jump into that, actually, we're going to sprinkle some uh, sponsor talks in between. So at first, I, I'd like to, uh, like to invite Chef out on, on stage here, and they can, uh, they can tell you what they do. Okay. You got it. Yep. Um, hey, my name is uh, Eva Van Dorn. I am one of the solutions architects at Chef. If you haven't heard of Chef already, we're uh, an automation framework uh, designed to automate your, all the things, essentially. Uh, we now also have things like Test Kitchen and Test Driven Development. As you saw earlier, I think Arthur spoke and, and talked about, uh, <coughs> excuse me, about Test Driven Development. And uh, come check us out at the booth. We can talk more about Test Driven Development, what Test Kitchen is. In fact, uh, the person that's responsible for Test Kitchen, Fletcher, is in town and will be at the booth this afternoon. So if you have any Test Kitchen related questions, whether you're using it with Chef or not, you uh, should swing by and, and talk to him. Awesome. Thank you, Chef. Please, please, please be tweeting out at our sponsors. This, these events like this don't happen without, our, without great sponsorship, and so we're, we're honored to have them here. All right, here we go. This is Ignites. Ready, set, go. All right, hello. Uh, my name is Andrina Kelly, and I'm part of the digital development team at Bell Media here in Toronto. Simply throwing technology at a business process is really successful. Technology merely substitutes in for whatever there was before, and minimal, minimal benefits are realized. Only by truly understanding each user's unique challenges can you transform the way they do their jobs. When you start to look at how people are defining DevOps itself, you start to see some interesting thoughts. Things like, it's just some crazy devs trying to get rid of ops, or it's some crazy ops trying to act like devs so they'll be better liked. None of this, in my opinion, really explains it until you begin to view DevOps as solving business problems rather than solving technology problems. While technology plays, an enable, sorry, while technology plays a part in enabling the solutions, it's about the business. Look at what makes a business run and not its technology or tools. Technology is a great enabler for making almost any business more efficient, scalable, and reliable. But when users don't even realize the technology is there, you know you've done your job. We're really talking about people and process here, not just the tools. What happens when you try to tackle the technology? You could build something fantastic, but if you haven't taken the time to sit with it and understand your users while building it, you've essentially built this, a fantastic looking useless tool. The same could be said for just putting a tool into place without adapting it for your people and understanding the process. Let me tell you a story about how I got my job. We were a company of silos. We had a product team that never felt like they were getting their ideas across to the development team, development teams that felt like their communications with the deployment and hosting teams were strained, and a QA department that had no idea what was going to be delivered and what time tomorrow the QA was going to be going out for release. Oh, crap. <laughs> so I started to take a look at process. At first glance, we knew that... Uh, at first glance, given that we knew what we knew about the silos, you might think that there weren't any processes in place, but quite contrary, there was. There was a lot of significant duplication, complexity, and a whole lot of email flying around with attached documents. It can be intimidating when you're thinking about technology. Um, for most of us who have spent our lives in technology, when you start talking about words like Docker, and people have no clue what you're talking about, their eyes glaze over. In talking to people, I got to know their jobs. I learned what it is they needed to accomplish and asked questions about how they did it. I heard a similar theme across every silo I spoke to. I needed to get people re-engaged, create a conversation, and get everyone collaborating. As a technologist, when we use the term proof of concept when we're trying to work on something new, it wasn't, wasn't really getting through. I needed to get people excited, and so I started using the term experiments. The takeaway I got most frequently when talking to people was a lack of visibility, getting a view into the other silos and being able to collaborate in an efficient manner. We already had most of the tools in-house we needed, and it was only the potential that hadn't been realized. 
My first experiment was to wean people off of email, Basecamp, Google Calendars, and all the other tools that weren't lending themselves to a transparent workflow. It was pretty clear from the initial conversation who were going to be my champions and who were going to be my resistors. I always tried to at least have one of them in the room for the discussions as the experiment progressed. Having that resistor in the room was very important to me. Not only did it bring very valuable questions up regarding the process, but when you find the moment when their contender has brought, brought, been brought into the process, they've now turned into your most valuable champion. One of the basics had been covered from our collaborative environment. People start to get creative. I got more and more requests to integrate tools even further and even create custom tools using the very technology that was providing the solution in the first place. It was my very own snowball rolling down a hill. We're realizing the potential of automation by putting continuous integration control into the hands of our product team. By mirroring the same build process used by our nightly builds for our product team, can simply navigate to their product page, go request a deployment build, and after their go no go meeting, that frees up the developers and my team from being the bottleneck to getting a release out. As time has progressed since my first experiment, I'm seeing a new culture evolve, one of collaboration and communication. The resentment and unhappiness I heard in my first questions have nearly disappeared. I get questions about streamlining and improving workflow from, from people that are completely engaged in the process. Let's go back to what that inf infamous first question of what is DevOps. It could quite simply be answered as people uh, being a comprehensive pro approach to people, process, and lastly, tools. It's a matter of recognizing people who are doing similar and complementary jobs and bringing them together to share their knowledge. Once you've brought the people together, you can start to see the processes, find the broken processes, you know, the ones that don't end up doing what you expect them to do, and start people thinking about transforming their processes and concentrate on accuracy and order first, and then you can optimize in the future. Having spent the time up front involving the people and understanding their processes, this is when we get to geek out and start automating and optimizing with those tools. You really get to pay off, uh, sorry, the hard work that you did up front with those people is really going to pay off now. Um, not with people simply just using the tools, but depending on those tools too. Technology itself is rarely a solution. Understand the people, and you'll understand the problem. Then you can fix it. This is DevOps for the people, all the people. Yeah. <laughs> Nicely done. The, the hardest thing about Ignite, if you, if you talk to any Ignite speaker, is the timing. Honestly, making your, making your points in 15 second intervals is friggin' hard. Mm -hmm. So how many people want to try doing it later tonight? <laughs> Come on, people. Ignite karaoke. We are going to try to do, run some Ignite karaoke if we can throw it together. What are you laughing about? Seriously, this is a lot of fun. Ignite Karaoke is a blast because you don't know the slides beforehand. <laughs> Seriously, this that is going to be helped. awesome. Think about, think about this, all right? Get, get, become brave, all right? Over, build up some courage over the course of this afternoon and seeing these other Ignite speakers and come talk to me after. We're going to do some Ignite Karaoke later. Thanks, Andrina. Nice, nicely done. All right, next up we have New Relic. New Relics is coming to speak with us. Again, one of our, one of our platinum sponsors. Please give them, give them a good hand. Toronto! How's everyone doing? Good. Uh, it's been awesome meeting a bunch of you come by yeah, the booth, whether it's been existing customers to learn you know, what's new or what's in the roadmap, or if you just came by to learn a little bit more about um, you know, how we're helping other DevOps teams at uh, Trulia, Nike, and like Walmart uh, succeed. Uh, if it's the first time hearing about New Relic, um, you know, my name's Eric. I help with the Toronto and kind of Montreal uh, areas. Um, and New Relic exists really to help customers and companies deliver, you know, amazing customer experiences. Um, and why that's important is customers uh, or businesses are all transforming into so a software business, whether uh, you're a large company, small company, whatever type of industry. And we're here to help, help them, help you guys get visibility into that. Um, with the advent of cloud and, and mobile, um, companies are finding new and exciting ways to interact with their customers. And that's contributing to top and bottom line results. Um, and, and, um, and the companies that are you know, using the software more strategically, um, use, playing offense with software, are turning to New Relic to help them get uh, a little bit more of a competitive advantage. Um, in the complex environment. Um, and New Relic really helps you kind of just be the one pane of glass to, to get proactive on problems, you know, understand what your customers are doing, 
um, and associate you know, things that are um, going on in your environment. So I know we're short on time, but uh, as things get more complex, we want to help simplify things, be that insurance policy for customers. So I look forward to uh, meeting anyone um, that's interested in talking by the booth. Um, you know, we're really excited to help you guys produce the best software possible, and again, software that absolutely delights your customers. Uh, my name's Eric from New Relic. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Eric. And again, please be tweeting at our sponsors. Thank them for the wonderful sponsorship that they've done. All right, next up we have Nick. Nick, you ready? Three, two, one. All right, let's do this. It's going, right? Yeah. So I'm Nick. I work at My Planet. Uh, we're building a product called Relay Robin. Um, and what it basically is, I'm a technical lead on it. Um, what it is, is a web-based management interface uh, written in PHP, JavaScript, uh, the usual stuff, manages video conferencing resources, uh, dial-in numbers, billing, usage tracking. Um, and uh, our customers are basically uh, telecoms and large service providers uh, selling video conferencing services. Uh, they all have data centers, so we deploy on-premise and to private cloud exclusively. Um, so what that means is some interesting stuff for ops. So we're pushing, uh, or they are pushing production upgrades maybe once every three to six months. Uh, very conservative, barely familiar with DevOps, a lot of network admins, uh, that's the mentality. And um, what that means is basically a lot of red tape, um, not a lot of experience with our supported OS, which is uh, Debian-ish Ubuntu. Uh, and the install needs to be very hands-off and kind of like an appliance mentality. Um, so on, on the other hand, we as a company, we have a huge focus on user interface, user delight. We're constantly trying to improve user experience and uh, that means a lot of change. So as a result, a lot of our focus is nimble code base. So easy to change. Uh, we have, we're very friendly to startup style pivoting on features and uh, experimentation. And we just have very little patience for the release mambo jumbo, you know, the usual inertia. So um, that meant a very early commitment to continuous delivery. Uh, that basically means for us very frequent internal releases. And then we just batch them up and release externally as larger upgrades. So um, that translates and it can only survive with very high internal expectations. So that means weekly or more often external sales demos on latest code, always latest. We fix defects first, first then build features. Um, and uh, that of course is not easy. So everyone has to know the stakes. If you break it, you fix it. The, the customer will see it next. Uh, we do have a lot of automated testing to support that. And of course, it helps to have a small team. We do unanimous uh, approval on code reviews. Um, and it also helps that we just have one branch, which is master, right? Of course, we do have other branches. It's just small, uh, short-lived uh, pull requests, uh, always merge back to master. And it's just always good to go. It's always trustworthy. Uh, we do track releases, of course, uh, for bug fixes. So they are treated as full forks as if a separate team is managing it, then we backport the bug fixes back up to master. And so uh, the actual packaging strategy is very simple. We just use Debian packages. Uh, they bundle up the code and installer scripts. Um, and uh, that means, uh, and of course, they're automatically built in our CI pipeline. Uh, we use Travis CI for building all this stuff. Um, and we heavily rely on data schema migration. So uh, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a way to do automatic uh, DB updates. Uh, it's, it actually looks like a sequence of very small delta incremental change scripts. It was actually made popular by Rails. Uh, um, and uh, what that means is developers are liberated to do any changes they want at any time, you know, add tables, drop columns, anything, and just build features. There's, it's always automatic. There's no custom follow-up. There's no friction. And as a result, our upgrades are also very simple. It's just unpack the files and run upgrade. Internally, that means that Debian, new Debian packages get installed. All the DB migrations get run, and that's it. So 
this, of course, hinges on discipline. So again, continuous delivery is our internal commitment. We always do external demos on latest. Uh, and everybody, designers, product owner, developers, we all run the same code, which is latest. Uh, and we have a lot of impatience. So we have a zero tolerance for, uh, again, the release memo jumbo and the friction. We have a huge pushback against manual steps, both for developer workstations and for production, of course. And uh, what that translated to so far is we have a very healthy year and a half old code base. We have 57 release tags just in the last year. And we actually have three to five versions in the wild at any time, uh, going back maybe two, almost to five months sometimes. And uh, one interesting case was a 20 minute customer install, full install. It was literally uh, like, oh, that's it. We're done. OK. And that means for us going home happy. We don't have to worry about things. And that's how we do it at my planet. Nice job. So now, mumbo jumbo, is that a technical term that I haven't heard of before? Uh, it's actually a Donald Knuth term. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a I should have known better. Awesome. Great job, Nick. Thank you. All right. We are going to keep the fun going. We've got, uh, again, more sponsors. We need to make sure that we're giving love to our sponsors. Please, please be tweeting at our sponsors. DevOps, uh, hashtag DevOps Days. And right now, we've got Puppet. Hey, everyone. I'm uh, Lee Rich with uh, Puppet Labs. I'm a solutions architect there. Uh, Puppet is a, uh, we take a declarative approach to configuration uh, management. Uh, we support all the major uh, enterprise platforms out there. We have the largest community, uh, largest community, largest uh, user base, and we have over uh, 3,000 modules on our repository, the Puppet Forge. Uh, with our latest release, Puppet Enterprise 3.8, uh, we've added automated provisioning for uh, Docker containers, uh, AWS clouds, uh, as well as uh, bare metal environments. And we've also introduced uh, uh, new approaches to make it easier to uh, manage your uh, Puppet code in uh, different environments as well. So if you have any questions or want to learn more, just uh, feel free to stop by the booth. All right, more Ignites, more Ignites. Everyone wants more Ignites. All right, here we go. We've got, you ready? All right, three, two, one, go. So you get more time. Excellent. Because your file is bigger. Yes. Don't. All okay, right. Go ahead. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Hani Fahim. I'm the founder and CEO of VM Farms. Uh, VM Farms is a fully managed uh, web operations company. Um, so today, I'm going to take you through an epic battle for uptime uh, between uh, our client, one of our clients' websites and uh, the might of celebrities. So as ops people, obviously, it's our job to keep web applications online. Pause. All right, so the year was 2012, so our company had just onboarded a new client. Uh, they were for a popular annual music award show. Our mission was to help keep their website online and scale it uh, during an upcoming event. Each year prior, their site had collapsed due to load um, because of celebrity might every time. This site um, was their weapon of choice was a WordPress site, and it had a lot of plugins. Um, it tended to explode on impact with big traffic every single time, um, especially during the, the nightly event. So in quarter number two, it was the reigning champion, the celebrity might. Their weapon of choice is millions and millions of fans armed with social media. Uh, they also tend to make ops people very unhappy, which is uh, part of the reason why this customer came to us uh, to begin with. So our, trainings, our training was... Our scaling strategy was to use load balanced uh, WordPress servers. WordPress is not very, low, not very load balancer friendly. We turn on all the caches and we decided to use GlusterFS to share all the files between the, the servers uh, because it's all single clustered. Um, so the first round was nominations event. It started at 9 a.m. Uh, 30 minutes in, the servers were holding the ground. Everything was looking great. And all of a sudden, within a blink of an eye, a huge influx of traffic hits and the entire cluster collapses. It wasn't very good. Um, so we started to throw everything at it. We built more servers, we threw it in the cluster. No matter what we did, uh, it actually seemed to make the problem worse. We had no idea where this traffic was coming from. It took us completely by surprise. We started looking at the referral traffic and realized it was actually all coming from Twitter. 
turned out to be this guy, uh, Justin Bieber. He had 40 million followers at the time, and his fingers of fury basically typed something along the lines of, hey, I'm nominated, go to this link and attack it. Uh, this actually caused about 70 megabits of traffic, which is a lot for a WordPress server. We coined this the Bieber bit. <laughs> so the cluster was down for the count. Uh, all the load was coming from Gluster itself, not actually WordPress. So we scrambled to actually dismantle the cluster to get everything back online, but it was too late. The client was pissed, the event was over, Celebrity had beat us at this point, so uh, we had to find another way. We regrouped, so that fan army, like I said, took us by surprise. We decided to duplicate the entire environment in our lab, and we replayed the logs and could reliably crash the cluster every single time. It turned out that Gluster actually had a core bug that caused the whole thing to lock up. So we didn't really have time to spare. The event was coming up. We had to rework our strategy. So we decided to take Gluster completely out of the equation and decided to opt for replication using LSYNC-D and some load balancer tricks to direct um, you know, the updates to a primary server. But we were sabotaged by WordPress. Um, soon after putting it into production, all our testing was good. The, clus the client reported that updates weren't actually being reflected whenever they made the changes. Um, it turned out to be stale cache files. And because each server in the cluster maintained their own cache, there was no way to notify them, hey, you, you, know, you need to invalidate your cache and, and push it across the cluster. So our solution was actually to write a WordPress pl uh, plugin, and it forced LSYNC-D to clear the cache. It basically creates and deletes the cache files, which forces it to sync across the cluster. So at this point, I think we were ready. So the actual event, it was Sunday, 7 p.m., the event kicks off, uh, traffic spikes as usual, but this time the servers were holding the ground, replication seemed to be working, it was a good strategy. But no sign of the beaver. His, uh, his Twitter feed was silent, maybe it was a no-show, we were hoping, at the very least. But no, hour two hits, uh, the alerts go off, traffic spikes through the roof, and it was obviously him. Uh, basically said, hey, something I, like, I hope I win tonight. Uh, it registered at 2.57 beaver bits, or 180 megabits. Um, <laughs> The servers are still holding the ground, though. It was working at this point. We're very happy. So in the end of the event, Bieber ended up winning three awards. The biggest spike registered at 3.71 Bieber bits, or 260 megabits. Uh, but the servers did not break a sweat at all. So we were even at this point. Everything was great. We were victorious. So our lessons learned from this whole thing, uh, replication and decentralization for the win. It was, it was actually a really good strategy. Using LSYNC-D, which is a great piece of software, uh, with some load balancing tricks, plus a lot of caching was an effective strategy. We could have easily scaled this at 30 plus servers. We didn't even need to go that far. Three years later, there were three more events, not a single outages, uh, not a single outage, and you know, we beat them by three points. Thank you, that's all I got. Hanny. That was amazing. And I apologize for not introducing you before that and just giving you a 3 two, one That was kind of rude. But you know Justin Bieber, right? Yes. Can you introduce me? No. <laughs> You'll hear him tonight. Karaoke, right? Huh? Huh? Ah. All right. We need somebody from HP to come up. Please, again, please give love to the sponsors. I see some people tweeting out at our sponsors. Please continue to do that. Thank you. Can you hear me? Chris Coda, I'm from HP Software. For those of you who don't know, HP Software is the sixth largest software company in the world. We cover so solutions in the end-to-end -end service lifecycle from planning, building, delivering, and running the service. So we can deliver all of the continuous capabilities that DevOps prescribes. And that includes con continuous operations when the service is in production, continuous assessment, or uh, loopback feedback of service performance and health. So we have a booth outside. We're raffling a Chromebook. Please, please come and see us. We'd love to uh, help you understand more about our solutions. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. How long is it? All right. Last ignite of the day until later in the day. I think, I think I did that wrong. All right, last Ignite, we have Duncan up, all right? Here we go, Duncan, you all set? Yep. All right, here we go. Hi, DevOps Toronto. Um, oh. wait, wait, I can't find the mouse. All right. <laughs> okay. So this came out of an experiment, a fully approved Skunkworks experiment that we did recently at FreshBooks. 
uh, where we looked at our deployment architecture. And we fell into a pattern of using CoreOS Fleet for distributed init to tell Docker what should be running, and I'm behind time already, and that reports into console. So we can now query console to find where our services are running, because that when you run it on Docker, you get it up to some massive random high port. So great, you got applications running. How do you get users to them? To do this, we ran Nginx on port 80 of every machine, and we made Nginx look up the location of the application with console. So this was all working great. Um, first, we used console template, but then we moved on to using Nginx Lua. Then, a Mark Story pointed out a uh, link to SeatGeek, who had used Nginx Lua to put their OAuth authorization right into their load balancer. So the applications themselves don't need to worry about them. So what we can now do is we can launch a new feature, we can change the background to pink, do some CD magic, and have two new applications running, which are of a different version from the previous one, and query console to find them. So now, different users come in, get authorized, a bit of metadata can come from your identity provider, and you can serve different versions of the application to different users. You can do some other tricks. Maybe you use Nginx Lua to send the idempotent request to two places and return the faster one. So there are some real good tricks that you can do with uh, Nginx Lua load balancing. Talk very briefly about how my first sketch of this idea would work. Now I'll move on to maybe why you'd want to be able to do this. Why you'd be able to serve different versions of different software to different people. And the first one that came up was that you would really want to bring your branches alive. So rather than have to get things merged to master to be able to put them in front of clients, why not just have a branch, you launch that application as a branch, and put it in front of people. This would be great for user testing. Obviously, you can get them to test your changes with data that's familiar to them, with their actual tasks, rather than coming up with some idealized scenario for them to run through, which might be unfamiliar to them. You may choose to do comparative testing. You may send the request to not only the live system, but the backup system, uh, the princess system, if you uh, follow the Etsy nomenclature, and then be able to compare the results of those two systems. You may find that you get a good uh, beta test community going, and they get the update straight away, and they're very vocal about it, and they're very good at pointing out what doesn't work from a user experience point of view. Or perhaps you segregate your updates by your uh, service packages, so the people who pay get a more stable solution than the people who uh, are free users who have been chugging along on your, six, your service for six months or so. And then there's the 1%. Whenever you introduce, every company's got them, whenever you introduce a change, they're going to be the ones that find it and somehow gummy it all up for everyone else. Maybe you just choose to segregate those customers off to somewhere slightly separate. Perhaps in your new microservice world, this is where you enforce version dependencies across different microservice containers, where your new application requires an endpoint to an existing application to exist before the user can use the whole stack. Perhaps it's where you put your data sharding in, and so you pass data, uh, metadata about where to find the customer's data to the applications, and you don't do any of this version stuff at all. Take a breath. Is this Nirvana? Probably not. It's just a first idea, but I can see that the commit to client pipeline changing quite a lot in the new cloudy, containerized world. I'd like you to think about the path that the customer takes through your application and how that relates to your source trees, because it doesn't just have to be a one-to-one -one mapping. So uh, if you're interested in the technology or the problems that I've talked about here, uh, FreshBooks is hiring, get in touch. It doesn't say so on the website because we haven't quite sorted out the thing, but thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Duncan, great job.
So that was Ignites. What'd you think of Ignites? <laughs> Fun, right? So how many, how many people, put, put, put up your hand if you've never seen Ignites before again. Okay, now keep your hand up if you're going to do, oh, I saw hands going down already. You didn't even hear what I had to say. Come on. All right, we are going to get set up for our next, next uh, speaker. And then uh, hopefully you guys have uh, been generating and thinking about some really cool ideas for open spaces. How many people have attended open spaces before at a DevOps Days? All right, we got a, got a few, a few old timers. Good stuff. Open spaces. Uh, open spaces, in my opinion, are, are one of the...